Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Living Room, brought to you by Curzon Home Cinema. Once again, for all of you who are watching this live, you can go to the video post on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. Send us in your question, presaging it with hashtag Curzon Living Room. Let us know where you're writing from, and we'll get through as many questions in the time we have. Uh, today, our guest is Andrew Haig, the writer-director of 45 Years. Hello, Andrew. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. And where are you currently based at the moment? I am in LA at the moment. So I'm in lockdown here, which is, uh, which is fine. It's like, I feel like my normal life is not leaving the house anyway, unless I'm filming. So it's not that different <laughs> to what I normally do. And so what's the time with you at the moment? Uh, 12.30. Okay, that's, that's not yeah. too bad. It's a, it's a very it's civilized hour. Yeah, it's not three o'clock in the morning then. Okay, so um, a lot of people will have watched 45 Years, which is on Curzon Home Cinema now. Um, so we'll start off with some questions around that. Hopefully we'll get some audience questions coming in as well. Uh, but we'll probably expand to your other films um, at some point. But I wanted to start, rather than talking about the idea of where it came from, um, I watched it again today. And just thinking about this, the convention of the three-act uh, movie where something is meant to happen 20 minutes in and I would have naturally thought if someone described the movie to me that it would be at the 20 minute point that we find out about this woman who's found in the ice in the Alps instead we find that out four minutes into the film which is quite audacious because we don't have the introduction to the characters we don't see what their relationship is like together or the world around them you you throw this at us straight away could you talk about the, your decision behind doing that yeah, I did think a lot about it, actually. And in certain versions of the script, there were there was more between the two of them, just getting on with their normal every day. And we did actually shoot some things with uh, Charlotte's character, Kate, just sort of wandering around the house and making more breakfast and all that kind of thing. And then it became really clear in the edit, and probably pretty much in the writing, that you needed that just to start from the very, very beginning. I mean, that is the point of the film. It is this this echo from the past, this ghost from the past coming in and shattering the present. And I feel like we didn't really need to know too much about either Kate and Jeff. I mean, we spent time just working out, you know what, if we see this woman on her morning routine, walking the dog that she does every day, and she makes the, makes the breakfast for her husband every day, that's probably all we need to know, to understand that this is what happens in a long-term relationship, that they've been together a long time. And it's almost like, what else is there to know you know, and I think if you have good actors and you're careful about how you shoot something, you can allow all those little details to tell the bigger story very quickly. There's something amazing as well about the, the brevity, the economy of your writing, because the first person we see after Charlotte Rampling's character is, is the postman. Um, and we don't need to be told that she was a teacher. And you just, you just have that, that shorthand that we understand straight away. But you also then understand the friendliness of her character and how much of a part of the community she, uh, community she is. Yeah, I mean, I think it's often like when you write scenes like that, you know, you get notes from people saying, um, Does this, this, do we need this scene? Is this a pointless scene? Um, and I think those, you know, everyday scenes where nothing seems to be happening is where everything is revealed. So, you know, we can reveal so much about her character through a simple interaction with a postman. And even when you see the shot, it's a long shot. You don't even really see them close up, but you just see the type of nature that she has and the type of personality she has, you know, just in that conversation with the postman. And I think it says a lot about her, it says a lot about her relationship with the people in the village, with her past, everything in just a little conversation. And this was an adaptation of a short story by David Constantine. Um, do you find it easier because I, we'll get on to what you're working on at the moment, but. Um, is it, is it a helpful thing to have a short story that, that perhaps has the kernel of an idea that you want to develop yeah. rather than something that's denser and bigger? I think also like, you know, there are better writers than me <laughs> in the world. And so I get a lot of, you know, my ideas from other people's work, you know, and having something like a short story that, you know, his original short story was so beautifully written. And, you know, I read it a long, long time ago before I made the film and was like, there was such a, a firm idea of what that, that was. And I think if I'm honest, I'm not very good <laughs> at coming up with sometimes those like those clean ideas that work to tell a story. And, you know, 
writers and authors are very good at that and so using other people's material is something I feel quite comfortable with and then I can take that as a as a basis to expand my ideas of something um, and it was such a such a pure image that came across in that in that short story about this body being found that it just you know it was it was it was perfect and I could not forget about it once I read it it was like I kept I was trying to do another project and I was like no no I have to do this one there was something so elegant about that kind of basic metaphor um, it's interesting you mentioned that this, this, this metaphor at the, at the center of the story. We've just had our first question, a really fantastic question from um, Frank, uh, Pat Greenhill, who asks, um, I heard the filmmaker Ari, Ast Ari Aster describe 45 years as a ghost story. I wonder what your idea about that would be and if it was something that you were conscious of while you were writing the film. Uh, yeah, I was definitely conscious of it. Like to me, you know, you know, all ghost stories are, you know, something from our past coming back to haunt us in the present. And that's exactly what was happening within this story. This was a relationship that is long gone. It's a woman that's dead. It's a past that doesn't exist anymore, but it's there and it's lurking. And I feel like I always love this idea that we live in our houses and we have attics full of our belongings and we have our, you know, secrets in boxes under our beds and we sort of hide them away. And I love this idea that they were sort of leaking out, that all of this past was leaking out. And affecting and infecting, I guess, the relationship in the present. So when you know she was going up into the attic, it absolutely to me felt like a like a ghost story or a horror film. I even thought of it, you know, as I was approaching it as a horror film, without you really realizing that. I like the idea that it it started as like, oh, here we go. This is like a you know another sort of just drama, old people in a house wandering around, and then it becomes something else. Um, and so we definitely and we leaned into that when we were shooting. There's moments that. Are almost kind of like dreamlike. She's, you know, wakes up and feels this breeze coming through the through the attic, and um, so a lot of those elements that I wanted to try and bring in to give it that essentially ghost story feeling. You've also got that other element that comes into it with the attic about the. Well, you've got three things. You've got about ownership. You've got the ownership of of physical properties, the ownership of space within that house, and then obviously there's the intellectual and emotional ownership of, of memories and feelings. Um, and they all seem to be, kind of fit together in this incredible jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, and I just think it's so true about relationships is, you know, you are very much a partnership in a relationship. You are together, you share so much of your life. You know, these two characters in this house bought this house together. They both work, they probably both paid for it. They both live in this house. And yet they, the house is full of their secrets, like physically, he keeps secrets in the attic. But also just there's so much when we're just back into our own isolation or back into our own thoughts and memories where our partners have no understanding of what we are thinking about going through, you know, feeling. And I think that's just really interesting. And in a relationship, you're constantly trying to, to navigate through that, trying to stay as a whole, trying to stay together. But there's all of these forces um, often from the past that are sort of affecting what happens into that relationship. It's funny, I remember years ago watching, I can't believe I'm about to admit this to a live audience, but I, I watched Nancy Myers, What Women Want. And- um, It's a good film, that. I like yeah, that. I, I, I love the yeah. concept of it, but you've got a yeah. man who, who, and it could have been, you know, you could have swapped it and had a woman reading other people's thoughts, but in this case, it's Mel Gibson reading women's thoughts. And I thought, my God, this, this could actually be a really, really great horror film. Mm. They actually finding out just how awful people could possibly be if you were to go into their mind. and and read their thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's horrendous, the idea that you could read people's thoughts. I couldn't think of anything, that, I couldn't think of anything worse than being able to understand what people are thinking. But it's also very hard to understand what someone else is thinking. You know, we can only see their kind of outward expression of what's going on in their, in their, in their, you know, in their minds. And so that's a very strange thought. You often forget that people have these really complex interior lives. And when you look at them from the outside, they just seem like they're just going on in their everyday, you know, normal life. Um, and so I like that about the story. And I like the way that they're just sort of, they're, they're, they're trapped into a, well, not trapped, they're very comfortable together. And there was never any idea to me that these two people in this relationship didn't love each other. That wasn't the point. They weren't being pulled at the seams and being pulled apart, not because they didn't love each other anymore, but just because of the pressures that we all face with trying to understand where we've been, what we're about, what we want, all of those things. So it's, it's interesting looking at this film about the relationship and, and just to come back to this sort of the three act structure and the 20 minutes in that um, up until that point in time, I'm thinking, OK, this is a deconstruction of a relationship between two people. And then you get to around that 20 minute mark and 
um, Charlotte Rampton's character says, I can hardly be cross with something that happened before we existed. Can I pause still? And then she goes up and takes the bath. And that was the moment I suddenly realized, no, no, this is actually shifting now because this has gone about, yes, it will remain about her questioning their relationship, but it's suddenly gone deeper than that. It's, it's now down to her own identity, which is incredibly troubling. Yeah, I mean, I always, for me, it was definitely at that moment is when she starts to unravel and everything just starts to fall apart for her. And it is about the understanding of who she is and what she's done and what she's achieved. And it's not even about her relationship with him anymore so much. It's about the choices that she's made and of the choices that they think they've made together. There's this sort of huge thing that has happened in the past that she's had no idea of, but it has also has dictated how her life has become. And then, of course, the minute you start thinking on that it's like what would have happened if things had been different if i had done this if i had chosen to do this if i had not looked after my husband neil i had done this and you know if you start thinking about all the choices that are open to you i mean it's horrendous like you, it's very good not to do that otherwise you literally would just fall into an existential breakdown of you know the worst kind uh, and again that 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 scene is really great because of of Charlotte's performance and I want to come back to some other silent moments in the short while but I've got a question here from Kelly Powell from Kennington who asks what direction did you give Charlotte Rampling for the final shot referring to the wide range of emotions that uh, she goes through? Um, I mean we talked we talked a lot about it but we also it was the last thing we shot we shot most of the film pretty much in order um, and so we always knew that it was coming and I like doing that but it's also very stressful because of the last day everyone's exhausted and everyone wants to go home and no one can be bothered anymore but um, it was, it was we, we just talked a lot about it and Charlotte was really sort of smart in what she said, I don't really know what I'm gonna do. Like, I don't want to like force an emotion. Like I think in the script at some point, it even said she breaks down in tears at the ending. And we talked about it and we said, look, if, if that isn't what comes in that moment, then don't force it. We shouldn't force any of those emotions. We just want to, want us to feel honest in that, in that moment. And we probably, I mean, it's a very long shot. It's like a big, long zoom shot, you know, and it was late in the day and it's like probably like six or seven minutes, the whole shot long. So there's only so many times you can do it. Um, and I think we did it maybe five times and it was the last take that we used. And there was just something in that moment. Um, and I, I know I wanted there to be a powerful kind of jolt of sort of both anger and confusion and fear and all of those things just somehow encapsulated in, in one moment, which is a very hard thing to achieve. But Charlotte, I mean, she's so good at being able to like show complexity. And for me, it's always about, I don't need to know exactly what it is that someone is trying to portray. I just want to know that something is going on. And I suppose it goes back to never really being able to understand what's going on in someone's head anyway. I just want to see the outward expression of something. Um, and so her in that moment was perfect for me. I just wanted to see pain, I suppose, and see doubt and see confusion and then allow the audience to decide you know, I mean, lots of people have different opinions. I mean, some people think she's going to leave him. Some people think she's going to stay with him. And, you know, that's that's great to me. I have my own opinion, but I'd like, you know, it's good that other people have theirs. Um, could you talk just about um, the work across, uh, talking about the whole performance in, in the film? Um, because one of the things that I found really interesting watching this film is that I know some people have this perception because of certain roles that, that Charlotte can be quite chilly. Um, and th th what this reminded me of, there's a wonderful scene in Francois Ozon's Under the Sand where her husband's disappeared, she hooks up with this other guy and at one point they're having sex and because he weighs, diff uh, he's a different weight to her husband, it, the way he's kind of heaving over her, it turns into a comedy scene. And it's just one of those moments of warmth that I think you bring out of her uh, throughout the whole of this film. Yeah, I mean, it was funny because when we started talking about her, there's always that like, it's like, oh, is she going to be too cold? Is she sympathetic enough? And I, I've never really understood it. I feel like female actresses get that a lot. She's not sympathetic enough. And to me, Charlotte is just a very kind of strong person. She's, you know, she's very much her own person. And that comes across in her performances. And there's a strength there that I always really liked. And I didn't want this character to be about, you know, a downtrodden wife living in Norfolk. I wanted this to be someone that was strong and has her own, you know, ideas of her life, has her own identity. And to me, Charlotte always had that. And I do find her warm. And I found her, as you say, in, in many performances, she is 
Um, but I think there is a world in which she sort of got typecasted into this kind of like, you know, whatever that character is. But, you know, I always loved it that, you know, I wanted that strength and I knew she had that warmth there when it needed to be there. An extension to that, I've got a question here from Philippe who asks, um, does Charlotte actually have a process when it comes to playing a role? She does, yeah. I mean, she's really committed to what she does and that's what's really fascinating. She's really intellectually committed to it as well. Like, I don't rehearse with my actors really, but I went and spent a few days with Charlotte um, in Paris and just sat down and went through the script with her. We talked about a lot of things and a lot of things about her life, you know, personally, a lot of things about my life personally. And we, you know, you sort of connect on that level. And then for me, that's where you get the basis to develop the performance, to a shared understanding of, you know, what's interesting and what's fascinating, what's challenging about, about the character. Um, and then her performance is just like, you know, every other, she doesn't, you know, I don't think she spends hours and hours learning her lines. I think she wants to feel them in the moment. Um, and it's interesting working with Tom because I think Tom has a different way of working. And so it's quite fascinating to see the two ways of them working together and how that connects. And I think in reality, even though it is different, it creates a little bit of spark and tension between the two of them, which I think is perfect for the film. And they do, they, they do spark off each other incredibly well right from the outset. Um, I'm, I'm just curious about little, little moments in the film. Um, just as you were talking then with the two of them, the moment he mentions Katya and you just see just subtly her hand move away. Um, but then there's the scene where she's looking right at the venue that they're going to have the party in. Um, and she looks up at the wall and, and sees the painting of, of the mountains. And it, she has the most fantastic expression on her face. I, I wondered how much of those scenes did you kind of direct her specifically or was it, well, in this scene we want to get from here to here? I think it's, a, it's I, I never really know like what you say to actors like I think I'm not I don't sort of give very firm directions about what they need to do in each take it's more about a conversation prior to the shot or to doing that scene for example we talk a little bit about it I'm quite um you know prescriptive on blocking so blocking is really important to me about where someone will walk and how the camera will you know interact and dance with that blocking um and so we always knew that the shot would end with that painting and that when she turns around we will see her reaction to it so I think a good actor very much understands what the camera is doing in relationship to the blocking and to what their performance needs to be so they know where their face is at the moment that the camera is seeing that turn and then they will give you know they, they feel it I mean a good actor feels it you know they know when the camera's moving in slightly they understand it um, and that's the exciting bit when you realize that everything has just has connected together the camera movement the acting the script for that like brief moment when you get a moment like that it's like oh yeah that works that's something special and it doesn't even need i think if you try and discuss it too much or try and you know make it absolutely you know precise beforehand it doesn't really work um i want to talk about the the way that you approach um time in your films and perhaps this is this is a perfect question for for where we're at at the moment because i think Weekend should certainly be on everyone's list of a film to watch at the moment of two people staying together with an enclosed space. Um, but I was amazed watching 45 years again this afternoon that this feeling that I got watching the film, thinking about the characters that I'm getting myself at the moment, that a week can fly by incredibly quickly, but an hour can feel like the longest period in the world. Um, there's a certain sort of elasticity to the way that you play with time, and particularly throughout this film. Could you talk about it sort of, is this something that just comes through in the editing? Are you aware of it as you're filming? I think I'm always aware of it. It does, you know, time is obviously like, it's insane a concept. Like, you know, I agree, we've been here in, in our houses for weeks and it seems to stretch forever, but I've got no time to do anything. So I don't really understand what's happening <laughs> within time at the moment. But I, I, I think it's also that a small period of time or an event, if it's a weekend in, um, in weekend or you know whatever is just a couple of weeks it's a week isn't it in 45 years can have such a profound effect you can go by years in your life and nothing really happens and everything continues as you can keep mind and then suddenly within a short space of time everything can change and everything is upturned and everything is done. and I just find that really fascinating I suppose and there is also a sense that when you put pressure on something like I'm sure there are lots of couples right now that are like fighting there's going to be lots of babies and there's going to be lots of divorces 
like you know at this moment in time you're, you're forced into this situation with the people that you love and it you have to ask a lot of questions when you're in that environment lots of things come up um, usually more about yourself than they are about the other person i'd say but so i just like i like that sort of slight pressure cooker feeling about something but also how yeah it can have you know such small tiny events that seem insignificant can have huge ramifications um one of the moments of one of the shots in the film that i really love it's just before kate is um taking jeff to the work reunion um it's an exterior shot looking back at the house and kate's looking out the window and it's a slow zoom going in and just in those seconds that we have clouds or, or you do something that passed by overhead, it goes, suddenly gets darker. It's such a beautiful shot. And again, it's this thing about the passage of time, about that moment can seem to last forever. Um, could you talk a bit about your relationship with Lol Crawley, the cinematographer on the film and, and the visual style that you achieved? Yeah, I mean, I love Lol, he's great. Um, he's actually out here at the moment. I saw him quite recently, this before the lockdown. But it's, you know, I, that shot, for example, I love the change in light. I think it does something really important. And as much as we could, we were like, okay, there's clouds in the sky now, let's try and film so we can have the sun coming in, the sun coming out, we can have the room falling into darkness. It's almost, it, it, it becomes another character. I mean, for me, I suppose the environment is very important. So, you know, we want, we wanted the outside world to be important to, you know, get a feeling of what's happening inside these characters' brains and, and their minds. And I can't remember how much our conversations were about visually, but I know we wanted it to feel very still, very sort of composed, quite classical, I suppose, in how we approached shooting it. Um, Lol was a big pusher to have it on film and shoot on film, which I think was definitely the right, right move. It certainly gives it a certain quality. And it just means things like you shoot on a film, you don't have to worry about putting your actors in makeup. And all of those little subtle decisions that you make, it's a lot easier, it's a lot more forgiving and beautiful, I suppose, film. So it gives it a texture where they, you know, which is perfect for people in their 70s, you know. Um, so yeah, we talked a lot about that and very little camera movement, you know, zooms rather than any kind of dollies. We didn't have a dolly on the film, we just used the zoom. Um, and such a long time ago since we made it, but you know, those conversations happen at the beginning and then you slowly start to adapt. And especially as you're shooting in order, you start to kind of alter and change and work out what works for you and, you know, and what works best for the film. Um, just thinking about Light again, though, in Lean on Pete, it, it's another extraordinary film. And what, what really impressed me with that film is that I got a sense that I was seeing in America that I hadn't really been seen before on film, not just in th this world of, of just off the racetrack, but the way this world looked. Yeah, I mean, yeah, again, it's like, it's those, it's those conversations, I think, especially when you're shooting um, in America um, and out in American landscape and in the things like diners and racetracks and all the things that have been so heavily seen on cinema before and in films, we're trying to find a different way to depict it, a different way to tell it, a different way to show it. You know, and so we, me and Magnus um, was the, um, the DP on that. And we talked a lot about making sure we didn't have any lens flares and we didn't have any light coming through trees. And all of those things that you've seen a lot in American sort of like independent movies, not that there's anything wrong with that. That's, you know, they suit those aesthetics, but we look for a way to, to find a slightly different aesthetic to show. I mean, essentially we were both Europeans looking at uh, an American way of life and we didn't want to shy away from that. And it was about using our slightly different viewpoint on trying to tell that story. Um, I want to ask about a specific sequence in the film, uh, sort of work through it with you, the attic sequence. Um, first of all, was the decision to have a slide projector your invention? Uh, yes. So in the book, it's just a photo album. Um, and uh, I thought the slide projector works. I mean, visually, it works beautifully, because obviously you can show the audience uh, the projector and the, the slides moving and you know you can go through those photos and I love the sound that kind of thing. but more importantly it was the decision to have it on a sheet rather than have the images of the photos on a screen or anything else so when we had it projected onto the, the sheet when we were like looking at it and testing it it just gave the image such a ghostly effect like it is moving slightly so it really did feel like this this image of Katia um from the past was moving and breathing and being part of it um 
even more so than even Charlotte is. It's almost like everything is very still in this attic, apart from this image that is being projected onto this onto this sheet. Um, and you know, we were filming in a real attic, and it was a tiny, tiny little attic. So there was probably no other way to shoot it anyway. But it was, um, yeah, it was. Um, I can't even remember if it was a sheet in the script. But certainly, when we got into that, me and Lowell were like, "We have to shoot this. It has to be moving. It has to be breathing somehow." And in terms of the, again, again, it's the thing about the pace of this scene. Did you leave it to Charlotte to decide when she would change the slides, or did you have it timed? I think I left it. I leave it to her. I mean, I always like to leave those things to the actors, unless I watch it and it's like it doesn't work. But so I think it's it's so I like them to take control of it in that moment. Um, and you know dictate what it is emotionally because I think the minute you start to give too much direction about certain things you can just it starts to become mechanical I suppose especially if you're having to do it take after take and we knew we weren't going to cut much in that scene so it's really you just you do a tape and you see how it goes and you let her let her click through the stills as quick as she wants and then we you know I think we talk about it a little bit um, but I don't do many takes I don't do too much you know coverage and everything I like to try and like you know, capture that moment and then just move on and not worry about it again. It doesn't always work, but that's the intention. Um, with with every change of the slide, we we have this cut to darkness, um, a cut to black, and at that moment after we've seen Katia and and she's pregnant, we suddenly have Kate's point of view of looking at the screen, and then you cut to black completely, and we're just left with the same. Could you? Talk about your decision with those two shots. Yeah, we spent, we actually, I mean, there's three shots in the whole scene, but we spent days going through the edit, trying to find the different, my editor, Jonathan Alberts, we spent a long time going through the exact kind of, you know, the cut points of that scene. Um, and it just, I love the idea of this, you know, there's the sound and there's the noise and there's the brightness and then there's just the darkness afterwards and just feeling, you know, Kate's pain rather than necessarily having to see it on her face felt more powerful to me just to be able to hear her breathing in that darkness for me is much more effective than you know seeing her cry in that moment um, that to me you know, you know resonates deeper and lingers longer so I was trying you know I think I'm always searching for those little moments that that you know that you remember that stick in your mind as being slightly off kilter than what you might normally do. Um Staying with the, the complexity of certain scenes, um, I've got a question from Simone from London um, about Weekend, the scene in Weekend where Russell enacts coming to Glenn, who's taking um, place of Russell's father is amazing. I think about it often, it seems simple, but it's really interesting and complex drama of uh, emotions. Could you please talk a little bit about the inspiration behind this scene? Uh, yeah, so it's when, you know, if you haven't seen the film, it's when this guy's lying in bed with this other guy and he's uh, pretending that uh, the boyfriend he's met is pretending that he's his dad and he can come out to him in that environment. Um, and I just like the idea that he was a person that had never come out to his father because he, he was, he was at, you know, in the story, he's actually adopted and didn't know his father. And I love the idea that this other person is showing this kind of act of kindness in um, understanding that it's uh, profoundly important for gay people to be accepted by their family and by their parents. And so for him to step in and allow that moment, even though it's a little bit silly sort of, and they're sort of laughing through it a little bit, the effect of that is really um, important for Russell and less so about anything about in terms of coming out, but more that this partner, this person that he's met understands his pain enough to want to try and ease it. And that to me is always, you know, the, the most, the, the key in relationships is understanding your partner and understanding when they need your help and you understanding, you know, and, and then being able to understand you when you need to be helped. And so that, for that moment, was what that was about for me. And, you know, I love that moment. It's very special for me. It feels like, you know, honest about what we need from our uh, relationships. Um, a constant that if, if you look at um, Weekend going through 45 years, um, even looking at Looking and um, Lean on Pete, is the attention you pay to sound like in weekend the, 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 it's not just the visuals that are incredibly intimate it's it's the sound and then 45 years uses sound much more impressionistically um how early in the process are you are you thinking about sound and and how it can be used or manipulated um, i'm thinking about it pretty much from the beginning and even in scripts i write there's like 
you know, direction about the sound and what I need the sound to feel. I think it just, it, it goes down to the very basic level that, it, that if you get the right soundtrack and you get the right emotional tone and timbo, I suppose, of the, of the environment, you feel it. And you can, A, it feels more realistic, I guess, but also it just has an emotional effect. And I try not to use too much music um, and I think sound, if you especially if you disregard the music and just really focus on the sound, you can make that become a character. And it can just have such a such a powerful effect. And I think sometimes quietness is far more effective than having lots of music and lots of noise. And then, or just even the slightest bit of sound, or whatever that sound is. You know, it is. You know, I mean, you know, lots of people have talked about it before. You know, but you know, you, if you have the sound, can replace things in the image, like. It's almost like you can have a really, really simple image, but it can be brought emotionally alive through the soundtrack. Um, we're almost down to time, but I do have a final question here from Artie, who asks if there's any news on when the North Water, your upcoming TV series, uh, will be finished and will be screened. Well, we're editing at the moment. We're still, even in this lockdown, we're doing like remote editing. We are nearly there. We have a we had a little bit of an issue with uh, some of the uh, lockdown stuff, and it's definitely slowed us down. Let's say, um, but the idea is, I think we're delivering by sometime late in this year. So it'll either be the end of this year or sometime early next year when it's when it finally gets on air. But we're in such a strange time, you know. How do you even, you know? There's so many things you still need to do in the process, and no one can be together. So it's a little bit tricky, but we're getting there. So yeah, soon. I look forward to seeing it. Um, 45 years, if you haven't seen the film yet and you happened upon uh, this interview, you can watch it on Curzon Home Cinema. It's available now. Um, Andrew, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. With regards to upcoming... Uh, uh, um, uh, scene to, no, no, start again. With regards to upcoming events in Curzon Living Room, we've got one tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, Kitty Green, the director of The Assistant, will be in conversation with Anna Smith. And then on Tuesday, the 5th of May at 8.30, Alok Hovgan, the director of Cunningham, the documentary about the brilliant uh, choreographer, Miss Cunningham, uh, will be in conversation with Mia Bays, um, the person behind Bird's Eye View and Reclaim the Frame. So please do join us for those events. Thank you for joining us today and take good care of yourselves. Bye-bye.